here I am going to call the September 16th uh, Dr. Cog board meeting to order. Uh, if you'd all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, we're going to start with the roll call. If I Nancy Sharp, Elise Jones, Here. Dennis Harward, Here. Tim Mock, Tom Hayden, Chrissy Fanganello, Here. Robin Kneech, Kevin Flynn, Here. Roger Partridge, Here. Gail Watson, Here. Don Rozier, Present. Bob Pfeiffer, Here. Bob Roth, Here. Sue Horn, Here. David Spellman, Here. Suzanne Jones, Tim Plass, Ann Justin, Here. Lynn Baca, Here. George Teal, Here. Kathy Noon, Here. Ron Engels, Catherine Heider, Here. Laura Christman, Here. Gail Christie, Here. Richard Champion, Jim Benson, Here. Debbie Nasta, Here. Joe Baker, Todd Riddle, Laura Keegan, Joe Jefferson, Here. Dan Woog, Mark Gruber, Joyce Thomas, Daniel Dick. Here. George Heath. Samantha Mearing. Lisa Jones. Laura Brown. Henry Ergot. Lynette Kelsey. Paula Bovo. Doris Rigoni. Saoirse Karras Graves. Here. Ron Rakowski. Present. Mike Hillman. Brad Weasley. Stacy Luberger. Shakti. Here. Jerry Bean. Phil Sunanik. Present. Jackie Malay, Gabe Santos, Here. Ashley Stolzman, John O'Brien, present. Colleen Whitlow, Here. Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Joe Gearlock, Here. Joyce Downing, Carol Dodge, John Dyack, Gary Howard, Here. <laughs> Rita Dozel, Here. Val Vigil, Janice Dove, Herb Atchison. Here. Joyce J. Gary Sanford. Here. Deborah Perkins Smith. Present. Bill Van Meter. We have a quorum. Okay. Okay, I am going to look for a motion to approve the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained. We have an agenda. We're going to start off with a report of the chair. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the Baghdad-Denver Regional Partnership. And um, if we, I think we've got a great picture that kind of uh, gives you a great sense of this. These are the um, 11 Iraqi and two uh, Denver region youth who uh, participated in this event along with, and if you were a board member or a staff that was here, will you please raise your hand if you participated in that as well. Um, I think it was a, a tremendous uh, opportunity to sit down and speak with these children from Iraq and have them kind of speak with some of the kids from America. So in addition to the kids and the board members, uh, Joe Rice, who really initiated this program, was there. Um, there were some interested residents that have ties to Iraq that also attended. There were two amazing young ladies from Project Voice um, that really added a lot of depth to the discussion. Uh, along with the two students, uh, one from Denver and one from Lone Tree, and I'm proud to say it was my daughter who actually asked me if she could come when she heard about what we were going to be doing. I'm going to give you an overview of the topics that were discussed. We really don't have a lot of time tonight to get into detail, but um, board members that were there, please raise your hand again, because if you'd really like to hear more about the discussion, and it was a very interesting discussion, please approach one of us to, to, um, to learn a little bit more. 
Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, boy, the world is flat. Uh, one of the youth walked in, you can't see him, wearing a CSU t-shirt, which I then said, oh, were you up in Fort Collins? And he said, oh, no. And I said, well, where'd you get the shirt? And he said, Amazon. Um, at the lunch break, the, uh, the kids were huddled over, their, the American kids and the, and the Iraqi kids were huddled over phones exchanging uh, you know, information and are now following each other, which I think is hysterical, in addition to liking the same music and um, same uh, movies and that type of thing. So I, that, that I thought was really interesting. But some of the, the issues that the kids discussed were um, the students' opportunity to have a voice in their local communities and, and how that happens here versus there. Um, I think there's much more organized ways for kids to participate um, here. And I should also mention the, the City of Boulder staff member and a Denver City staff member over here that spoke a little bit about the programs for uh, youth commissions and councils in those communities as well. Um, the kids talked about education and career opportunities uh, with a particular emphasis on the different experiences for men and women in the two cultures and um, some insight that my daughter shared with me uh, when we at dinner that evening was boy she she ha she really was so proud to be a female American uh, student with a lot more uh, I think opportunities exist but I think the jobs afterwards for some of the Iraqi women weren't quite the same opportunities for the men and some of the men that were in the room disagreed with that so it was interesting to hear the kids kind of debate that issue themselves um, one thing I think we should also take note of that um, the thing that the Iraqi kids were most surprised about uh, here was the homeless situation they did not expect to encounter that um, to quote one of the kids in um, in a country with one of the greatest economies in the world that they were surprised to see um, and then there was a very vigorous debate about why that occurred and that was a very interesting conversation as well and as I said the board members raised their hand so we can share more details and um, should time permit I'll, I'll ask at the end of the meeting um, if, if any other board members might want to share that were in attendance might want to share their uh, thoughts as well. Um, RTC, Regional Transportation Committee, met yesterday. Uh, they discussed the uh, Transportation Improvement Program amendments that we will be discussing tonight, and they recommended approval of those. Um, they talked about continuing opportunities to work with our federal, to, for lobbying efforts when we go back to the federal government between CDOT, RTD, and Dr. Cog, and I think we all agreed that that made a lot of sense. Um, they also discussed moving the RTC meeting date from the third Tuesday of every month to the second Tuesday of every month to allow for greater time uh, for input prior to our board meeting. So uh, RTC, if they wanted questions or wanted to make suggestions to the board, staff would have more of an opportunity to do a turnaround. So we have not confirmed changing that date, but that is something that's being explored right now. Um, I want to let you know the Structure and Governance Group met also. Uh, they had a, a detailed discussion on membership dues, and they also talked about the role of MVIC and how that might change moving forward, and there will be more to come on that. That was the ninth meeting of that organization. Um, so stay tuned for more on that. I am going to ask um, Deborah Perkins-Smith to uh, speak for a couple of minutes about the CDOT Transportation cu that Summit that is coming up on October 28th. Deborah, I heard your voice, but I'm not sure. Oh, there you are. Okay. Great. Um, I believe you all have a flyer at your place, and we have a summit coming up on October 28th, and Jackie, I think you can probably speak to afterwards what... Um, Dr. Cog has some has a table there. So first of all, I want to thank um, our sponsors. We ha obviously have a number of private companies that are sponsoring, but specifically Dr. Cog, City of Lone Tree, RTD, and the I-70 Coalition Bail Associates are are sponsors as part of this, and so we really want to thank them for that support. The focus of the summit is really to look at uh, the emerging technology and how that can affect what we're doing in terms of transportation. It's actually very exciting. There's a lot going on in, in the automotive industry as well as um, in terms of data information. So it starts at 11 o'clock in terms of registration. Our keynote speaker is the Secretary of Transportation, Anthony Fox. We also have uh, Governor Hickenlooper there as well. 
And in some of the breakout sessions later on, we have several executive directors of DOTs from other states, including Kirk Stiegel, Stiegel from Michigan DOT, and they're doing some very innovative stuff um, in terms of using technology and vehicles. Uh, representatives for the American Trucking Association and also another executive director, Malcolm Darty from Caltrans will be there as well, as well as Jim Whitty, who's the director for the Oregon Road Usage Charge. So that's just a few of the people that will be part of this um, event. And I think you will find it very enlightening in terms of what the future has to hold. And based on this summit, uh, we have a new initiative that will be coming out of that called Road X. And you'll hear a little bit more about that in the future, probably from our executive director. But it really is taking um, and taking a look at this merging of technology and how can we apply it, apply it to our transportation system. And we've got a few ideas about maybe how we could do that. And I think this transportation summit will help us formulate some additional ideas along that line. So with that, if there are any questions, or Jackie, you might want to talk about um, Dr. Coggs. So I, I do want to let everyone know there is a flyer on your desk amongst the papers that you see there that talks about the summit. There will be some limited seating available through Dr. Cobb. Um, <coughs> so if you are interested in attending, if you could please um, forward your uh, interest to Connie, and she will uh, be collecting names. So thank you. <coughs> and I went last year. It was really a great day. I learned a lot and really found it very valuable. And I think. Um, Roger, you have a comment on the, on the Transportation Summit? Uh, yes, just a question. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, two things. One, if we may be able to get the time, Deborah, if they, and the other, is it ironically that it's one day before the end of the Transportation uh, uh, Extension? Uh, Hopefully we'll have to do it by that time. <laughs> and, and I think it's 11, to, I think it starts at 11. <laughs> Registration starts at 11. Um, keynote speaker will probably, who's the Secretary of Transportation, will probably be at noon. But registration has started at 11. Thank you. And uh, I, should also I would also like to let the board know that Elise Jones and I will be going to Washington, D.C. September 28th with um, Doug Rex and Jayla Sanchez to, and our, and our uh, federal lobbyist, Mickey Farrell. Mickey, you're here, so can you stand up and just give the... Uh, we will all be going uh, September 28th to the 30th to talk to our federal uh, legislators about the Older Americans Act reauthorization and uh, transportation issues. So um, wish us well and think good thoughts for us on that journey. Um, I also want to let you all know that the Transportation Commission dinner is going to be held October 14th at 530 at the Hilton Garden Inn, in, um, and I did not pick that. That was the Transportation Commission's pick. Uh, and um, we also have limited seating available for board members who might be interested in attending that. So I think it's a great opportunity to sit down and, and uh, have a dialogue with some of our trans state transportation commissioners. And now I'm going to conclude with something that I'm not very happy about. Um, as some of you may be aware, our esteemed uh, past chair of Dr. Cog is moving on to bigger and better things, and she will be uh, moving out of Colorado, and I'll let her give you the details. But I'd like to speak for the board when I say, Sue, that your uh, perspective, your regional uh, outlook for uh, the Denver community, uh, I think your um, dedication, your perseverance. I think you are the longest tenured board member that is here. I know you thought you were going to be the uh, past chair emeritus, and I think for a while you were because you've been serving in that capacity. And um, for those of you that don't know, uh, serving as a, an executive officer takes a ridiculous amount of time. And the fact that Sue not only did that uh, for four years on her way up to being the chair, then served as chair and has been serving as past chair for the last three years? Is that? It just feels like three in dog years here. But, um, but it's amazing. And I think the energy and enthusiasm for this region that she brought is really without uh, comparison. So I don't, I don't know anybody who has contributed um, her work here on Metro Mayor's Caucus. and. Um, 
again, I want to thank you and I want to ask my fellow board members to join me in a round of applause and stand up for, for Sue. has obviously not heard some of us sing. <laughs> so we're going to let Sue talk. So Sue, who has been the voice of reason at this table for a, lot, for a number of years, please share with us what your plans are and what you're doing. Thank you. I really appreciate all your kind words. And, and um, now I know how you get a standing ovation. That is, you move. Um, it is... My, my partner, uh, sometimes Ron calls him the elusive Mike, got a transfer to Orlando, has been there working for a month. Um, this is something he's wanted for over 20 years. And so um, I will be joining him, assuming that our house closes on schedule at the end of the month. If not, it's not really farewell. I'll be here at the MBIC meeting. But, <laughs> um, but I did want to say just for a minute, I threatened an hour speech, and you'll be thrilled to know it's going to be a couple minutes. Um, it has been such a privilege working with all of you. And sometimes I think we don't know how important this work is. We know how hard. Um, but everybody, this is very hard work. Everybody who's here is here because they care about what happens to this region. Otherwise, you could be home right this moment watching NCIS reruns. Um, so, or, oh, yeah. Oh, or that's probably what I'd watch. But anyway, the, um, th this is hard work. You have to balance your municipality's needs and the region's needs, and that is not easy to do. The discussions are robust. Sometimes they may get heated, but to me that makes the decision a better decision because everybody gets to say what they need to say. I commend you all, and I know you're all going to do a really great job continuing with that focus on the region while balancing with your municipality or your county. Um, the one thing I would hope you would also do, we're always, as a species, we like to look at what we did wrong, not so much what we've done right. And we do a good job at critiquing what we've done wrong. Take some time to talk about what we've done right, because this is just a terrific organization that gets a lot of things right. So take some time to smell the roses. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. And one of the things we did right was elect you as chair. So oh, thank, thank you very, very much again for your service. And wait, get some cake. And There's let a them big eat cake, cake out there, right? Let them eat cake, okay. All right, moving on to the, to the not sad but important work that we are doing. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, the executive director to uh, share her thoughts uh, uh, what's going on. Well, I too am very sad to see Sue leave. Um, I asked her if she had actually been to Orlando since she's making this move because it's very hot and humid there. Uh, and you can never have a good hair day in Orlando, I'm telling you right now. Uh, speaking of Sue, I'll call to your uh, attention the, another flyer at your seat. Uh, there's going to be a, um, a little party for Sue out in Bennett. Um, on, I guess it's next Wednesday, uh, the 23rd, from 3 to 5. So stop in if you can. So if um, you've never been to Bennett and you just want to drive <laughs> 25 miles east, this is a great opportunity to do that. Um, just a, a couple of uh, things I wanted to let you know that we're gearing up for our federal, federal certification of the MPO. Uh, we're already starting the planning, but we really start kicking into higher gear uh, come October. There will be a site visit by the feds uh, probably in January, and we don't expect to really see a, an actual final report from the feds until probably the second quarter of 2016, but we're, we're working on that already. I want to um, thank the city and county of Denver. Uh, Dr. Cog applied to Denver Public Works for, uh, in, we applied to their, bark, blah, 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 their bike parking program, and uh, we were actually approved for three bike racks outside this building, so we're very excited that uh, it's just another opportunity for staff uh, as well as uh, members of the board and other visitors to uh, walk the talk here at Dr. Cog. Um, and just a couple of other things. Um, 
kind of uh, to what Sue was saying a minute ago, um, we received a call from the Atlanta Regional Commission's Millennial Advisory Board. Um, they were asking how it is that Denver is so successful in getting things done, particularly on the transportation front. Um, we explained that we have a strong foundation of working together for more than 60 years now, and even though it's not always pretty, we do always get it done. Um, we also got a call from the American Planning Association, uh, folks that are working on putting together the national conference, and they called about Dr. Cog's Boomer Bond program. Um, if you um, aren't aware, the Boomer Bond is really a toolkit for our member governments to identify how they can make their community uh, more age friendly. And the APA had actually learned about the Boomer Bond program through the Washington, D.C. Mayor's Office. So I don't know how the Washington, D.C. Mayor's Office heard about this, but it just goes to show that the, um, the word gets around about the great work here at Dr. Cog. Um, and just one, <clears throat> excuse me, one additional handout at your table. Um, I told Anthony Graves I would, we would put this out. Uh, they're doing a marijuana management symposium um, uh, in, in November. So that information is at your desk uh, as well. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, moving on to uh, <coughs> agenda. Excuse me. Oh, oh, excuse me, Joe. Before we move on to um, uh, public comment, if I could just interject for just a second. I'm Joe Jefferson from Inglewood. I did have my alternate in the audience tonight. I, I apologize I didn't uh, jump quick enough when we uh, moved on. Uh, but I do have Steve Yates in the audience tonight. He is our um, new alternate from the city of Inglewood. Steve's um, uh, in the middle of his first term. He represents the city at large. He's in the fire suppression and assisted living business. So uh, please welcome Steve. Welcome, Steve. And, and Steve, we knew you were coming, so we ordered cake. Um, <laughs> so we are now going to the train. It, it may, they just misspelled Steve. Come on, Herb, go with it. All right, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, all right, now we are going to move on to public comment, agenda item number seven. Up to 45 minutes is allocated at this time for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public for from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Deborah Perkins Smith, please. I'm here again. Hello. <laughs> so on behalf of CDOT, uh, I, th I believe at an earlier meeting you heard that Tony DeVito, our Region 1, director, RTD, uh, has moved on within CDOT to become the project director for I-70 East, which we refer to now as, I think it's 70 Central or Central 70, so as part of that project. So we did a, opened up the position nationally and had a lot of national candidates that actually applied for the position, and I'm very pleased to, to, to announce that Paul Josaitis, who was, is in within Region 1, and he's been at CDOT 17 years, and also has been a member of the Dr. Cog TAC, was selected for the position, and we're very pleased to have him in that role. So, Paul, do you want to say anything? Please, Paul. Mm -hmm. Now, I've seen you a lot, but I don't think I've ever seen you in a suit. But, so, I'm going to say thank you for dressing up for us. <laughs> you no, know, it, it was just for you. Oh, okay, um, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I have the uh, just distinct pleasure of representing the 300 engineers, technicians, and uh, planners, uh, specialty, right-of-way people in Region 1. And right now, that group of people, um, we've got about 349 projects that are active in some form or another, anywhere from environmental to uh, construction to design. So it's a big, uh, you know, 300 people, 350 projects, and then we've got another 500 people in maintenance. And uh, for me, that was the new thing, because uh, for the last two years, I've represented Region 1 as the Deputy Director of Program Delivery to deliver that uh, big billion-dollar program that we have. 
And so we're doing lots of innovative things where, uh, you know, uh, Deb talked about uh, some of our new technology initiatives. We've got a people peak where we're really trying to focus on how do we make our DOT the best DOT in the nation, and we're supporting Shailen in doing that. Um, we're talking about how do we improve our uh, modal s our system um, with modal choices and um, anything we can do to eke the um, most out of what we have. So, uh, you know, it's been an adventurous week um, and month since I've been the director. Um, it wasn't long before Tony called me up and he said, it didn't take long for your first bridge hit. So uh, we had a bridge hit where actually it was four, I said Tony, it was four bridges, it wasn't uh, one. And so we had a guy, and then Shaylin said, well, why would, why would somebody hit four bridges? And, uh, I, you know, I'll just leave the commentary out on that part. Um, so Can we refer to one of the exhibits? No, I'm just kidding. And, you know, in, interestingly enough, in Region 1 on Monday, we had two different bridges hit two separate times. So I actually went out with our maintenance people in the middle of the night because we've, um, we've also had uh, bridge deck failures. Um, we've got a bridge deck repair project where we go out every year and repair all the decks in the metro area that we can get to. But some of those decks um, we'll lose. Uh, we'll get a pothole in the middle, middle of the night. And so I had the pleasure of going out with our maintenance people. And I'll tell you, um, they are a crack. If you have any doubt that these guys can go out there and repair a hole in a bridge deck, it's like a military team going to work, and it was just fun to watch. So it's very reassuring to me that we have just such absolutely great people do the work of the region out there. So anyway, I don't want to take up uh, too much more time, but you know, I exist to uh, really serve all of you and the people of Region 1. And so uh, you know, you can call me day and night. I probably regret saying that, but um, you know, um, everybody else does. So um, thank you very much. Congratulations. Is there anyone else here for public comment? Seeing none, I'm going to close the period for public comment, and we're going to move on to our consent agenda. Uh, may I have a motion? Ta All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained. OK, we are moving on to the action agenda, um, item 9, attachment B in your packet. We're going to discuss innovations, partnerships, and opportunities that create more value to member communities. And our executive director, Jennifer Shevel. Yeah, I'm going to share my time with um, Jerry Stiegel. But uh, this is attachment B in your agenda. So let me just briefly go through the schedule and what it is we're doing. Um, we are, this is part of that work that we've been talking about now for quite some time about sharpening the organization's uh, uh, strategy. This is about looking for new ways of doing business. This is researching best practices of our peers across the nation, figuring out ways that we can actually measure our performance. So in August, um, one of the things that you talked about doing in August was to combine adopting the work program along with the budget. And so we showed you the strategic initiatives that we have in the budget and the cost, the estimated cost at least, that we, uh, were associated with those. And um, uh, you didn't really have any, a lot of comment on those. So. Um, the one thing that you did ask, and I'll, I'll come back to this in just a moment, but one thing you did ask was which of those programs that, were, that we provided you uh, a list of, what's discretionary and what's mandatory? Uh, tonight we'll be discussing um, our strategy work here at Dr. Cog and how we might go about enhancing our activities and our revenue sources. In October we will be taking a lot of budget material to the administrative committee and looking for their approval of the or recommendation of the budget to come to the full board in November. But getting back just a minute to last month, again you asked for what was strategic and what was discretionary. Um, this is the first attachment uh, behind this item. That's the, uh, the same document that you saw last month except we have gone through it and identified those things that are mandatory and discretionary. We, we took a very simplistic view of this. If it was required by law, if it's in a contract, if we currently have a grant, we deemed it as mandatory. Everything else we said discretionary. So 
Before I go any further into new business, uh, let's try to wrap up the old business and let me know what questions you may have about that document now that you have that new information. So just everyone, the strategic initiative summary, just everyone have that in the bracket? Okay. Any questions to, for Jennifer regarding this? Okay, I think we can move okay, on. Okay, cool. So we have some challenges in front of us, but we also have a lot of really good opportunities as well. Our first challenge is that our needs are outpacing our resources. The AAA, I think, is probably one of the best examples that I could give. We have stagnant funding coupled with some really bad formulas in the existing Older Americans Act versus just the sheer number of people that are turning 60 here in the region. We had an economic downturn that started reducing the philanthropic giving and that increased uh, the request for services from Dr. Cog. We are both blessed and cursed by the housing increases here that we're seeing in the region. Uh, it's actually pushing some of our senior clients into homelessness or prematurely into nursing homes and assisted living facilities. We have the issue of people are just living longer. All these things combined, we have wait lists for things like meals, transportation, rides to and from medical appointments, that sort of thing. The second challenge that we have is maintaining a healthy fund balance. Uh, every organization's stability and health relies on uh, it, its resources and having, having money in the bank to pay for the bills that come in. The largest expense we have in our fund balance is for our federal match, those uh, dollars that are required to draw down transportation planning funds as well as staff the AAA. Um, there are also other expenses that draw down the funds, though. There's uh, state and federal lobbying. We have a contract uh, with a lobbying team to help Rich Morrow um, at the state capitol. You met Mickey earlier. Uh, so that's, that, that draws down on the fund balance. There's the support of meetings like this. Uh, there's staff salaries associated with those sorts of things. There are memberships and, and uh, sponsorships. There's all kinds of things that, that help to draw down that, dr that fund balance. We're very fortunate, though, that we have a lot of opportunities here as well. And so what we're talking about tonight is actually adapting to the changing environment that we find ourselves in. Dr. Cog's staff is looking at this from a, a multi-pronged approach where we explore ways to leverage what we've built, both in staff and technology and this, these things together will help us meet the challenges that I just described. Um, this isn't completely new ground for us. We have, uh, we have innovated before and been very successful with it. The uh, aerial photography program, for example, is one of the most successful public-private partnerships uh, in the state. It's where member governments enjoy a really great product they get every two years for pennies on the dollar that they would spend otherwise. And the reason that happens is because we brought the private sector into the uh, picture and they're paying for the lion's share of this. There's our fire program through economies of scale. Our members enjoy a savings and get a service that they desperately need. There's the SHARP-2 grant that we've recently received from the federal government. It is a grant that is going to do work that we had already put um, in the budget under our Unified Planning Work Program, but these newer funds will pay for that and we have the added advantage of it doesn't come with any match, so there is no drawdown on the, uh, on the, on the general fund. And then we have programs like the Boomer Bond where um, AARP said, you know, this is a great program, it has great value, we're going to help you pay for some of this work. So this isn't completely new ground for Dr. Cog. I think I probably gave you a hint of this in my comments a moment ago, but we're re recognized for having subject matter experts here at Dr. Cog. We have developed some exceptional technology. The board is, uh, has this great uh, reputation for collaboration. All these things uh, are assets for us. Strategic partnering, cooperative and shared services are both ways to maintain and diversify our fund balance. 
But it's also a way to capitalize our assets and improve on the level of service that we're already providing to our members. In some instances, we're not even looking for the opportunity. Opportunity is actually knocking on our door. We have a hospital association who has recognized the great work that we did over the last two years in our community care transitions program. This is a, a program intended to reduce uh, senior, uh, seniors' readmission into the hospital environment. Uh, as I said, this was a, a two-year grant. We um, saw over 900 high-risk Medicare beneficiaries during that time period. And as it relates to readmissions, we beat the national average by seven percentage points. We beat most of our peers in the program by three percentage points. We estimate that we saved about $7 million in Medicare funding. So we did a great program. Hospitals are being penalized for readmissions uh, through the um, Affordable Care Act. And so now they're knocking on our door and saying, wow, we've heard about your reputation. We've heard about your success. We want you to come and work with us on this. Um, so that, that just says, again, so much about the reputation of Dr. Cog and the great work that we do here. Um, our peers around the nation are facing the exact kinds of challenges that we are. Needs are outpacing resources. Um, their funds are being drawn down because money is stagnant and, and needs continue to increase. Um, I, want to, I have several examples, but I just want to give you just a, a small handful of how our peers are beginning to deal with these issues. For example, Phoenix, uh, the Maricopa County uh, Council, they're doing mapping and technical analysis for uh, the state's economic development corporations. Uh, in San Diego, they handle all of the travel modeling, so none of that work is uh, if a, if a, if the, the DOT or the transit agency or even the member governments need travel modeling work, they don't have to hire a consultant. They go through the COG to get that work. The COG charges for it, but nowhere close to what a consultant would charge for it. Uh, still others manage the region's purchasing. Uh, some are negotiating uh, preferred pricing for health insurance. Uh, others are involved in broadband, pl broadband planning. And I, I, to me, this is one of the most unique. Our peer sister uh, uh, council over in northwest Colorado, they're actually making business loans over there. And that's not to say that any of these strategic initiatives are right for Dr. Cog. It's only to point out that um, th there is room for innovation. A lot of our peers are doing it. And that's the beauty of the strategy work that we're doing here at Dr. Cog with, with Jerry, both at the board level as well as the staff level, because strategy really has to be tailored to the organization. You can't just take someone else's strategy and, and implement it and think that it's going to work for you. So you've all seen and, and been involved in a lot of strategic planning efforts. I'm, I'm sure in your organizations, both current and former, you probably have learned, too, that one of the most important things is, is how you go about organizing uh, your strategy that's key to making it work. Um, so I, I guess maybe now I'll, I'll stop here and ask Jerry to come up and talk a little bit about the strategy work that we're doing here at Dr. Cog and how we can leverage the assets we have to provide a better level of customer service going forward. So do you want to? I'm right behind oh. <laughs> I'm ready. Okie dokie. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. How are we? We're Who's great. seen this before? Yeah. Anyone seen that model before? Oh, that's what's throwing us off. Okay. I'm just going to quickly run that top to bottom just to get everybody on the same baseline. I have two slides and that's it. And as Jennifer was indicating it, this next, the next slide will really start to give you an understanding of how we have started to craft this strategy internally. So mission vision at the top of this pyramid, uh, we did the revision of those last year, as you know. 
uh, strategic perspectives. I'm actually going to come back to that one because we've touched on it a number of times, but not in detail. Overarching themes and outcomes, we've talked about those. Those are result statements, uh, our critical five themes um, MVIC is working on. Outcome statements are the uh, sort of the end goals we're shooting for. Objectives, uh, I will uh, mention just as a continuous improvement, MIMVIC's looking at that eventually. They'll be looking at the objectives. Strategy map, you've seen before, referenced, and I will come back to that and show you one. Performance measures and targets. How do we know we're achieving the results we're achieving? So we design measures for the objectives. Those measures report back to us how we're performing on that objective as it's tied to that outcome. And the last thing are strategic initiatives, projects, and programs that truly just give legs to your objectives and measures. The strategic projects, and I, I know Deborah mentioned a couple, and they have some names for those. Those are exactly what we're talking about that drive an, an objective and to it toward an outcome. And I see some affirmation there, so it must be working. So um, that's the key piece there as we go through. When you go back to perspectives, perspectives are lenses, if you will, or focus areas kind of for your strategy. And the perspectives run the gamut. The original from Kaplan and Norton started out with customer stakeholder, financial, internal process, learning and growth, in that order top to bottom. It, we have actually changed those perspectives for our need, and that's what organizations tend to do a great deal. Our top perspective, our focus for our customer is community and residents. You'll see that show up in a few minutes. Financial stewardship as a nonprofit, that's our obligation with the board and staff to make sure we are stewards of our finances, our resources. Business operations can be summed up as faster, better, cheaper, or the catch-all is efficiency. Skill workforce is our other perspective, is the employee perspective. It's the capacity. Uh, I use this analogy a fair amount with my colleagues. You can't build a 3,000 square foot home with a Swiss Army knife most likely. Even if you had the tools, you probably a book won't cut it either. So you've got to build the capacity internally. So that perspective is the key one. So in our business operations and skilled workforce capacity, they drive the other two. So we're going to look at that next. But let me ask about strategy map. Who has ever seen a strategy map? I expect to see one or two hands. Oh, I see more. Thank you. Good. Those are critical components to, I think, explaining and communicating your strategy. So strategy maps primarily communicate visually what you're trying to accomplish and how you're trying to do it. So they give you a visual illustration of the cause and effect links in your objectives. So objectives are the ovals on a strategy map. They appear there in the cause and effect that helps you understand uh, how to get from the things you do internally to the outcomes you're shooting for at a customer in a community residence. And the key to execution and strategy and measurement is on the back end is clarity on the front end and developing as, uh, the outcomes as clear as you can. So let me move to the next piece. That is the Dr. Cog strategy map that we've been working on for some time. It's an internal, these are operational objectives. Why don't you look at that for a moment. I'm going to read it from bottom to top. It should be read top to bottom equally. It can be that way. So it should read top to bottom, bottom to top just as well. But I'm going to start with that bottom capacity building perspective that we now term skill workforce. And when we can enhance our knowledge, skills, and abilities of our staff, provide the technology tools, and build a culture of collaboration it sets the stage for improved internal and external communication, which supports our improved process objective and quality services and products objectives. Both support our strategic partnership objective. And I'll take a sidebar. That's one I introduced oh, several months ago, I think, in a, in a meeting that ties again to our overall strategy. So if we improve our, uh, excuse me, strategic, if we improve our partnerships by improving our uh, partnerships, we can also increase our funding. And by improving our processes, we're going to improve our cost management. So time is money, and by getting more efficient in processes, we save the time for other things to do, for additional uh, either services or initiatives. Those both drive the investment 
objective. So we want to increase our strategic resource investment, which will help us promote informed decisions at the community residence level, help us improve the quality of life, if you will, to live, work, and thrive in this region, which maximizes our value to communities, ultimately culminating in an enhanced and protected quality of life in the region. That's how that story can go. And that's how, it's a number of ways you can read it. But you notice I tried to stay with how they connect together. And in strategy maps, you try to make the one or two strongest connections between objectives. And here's the problem we have right now. There's as many definitions for those objectives as there are people in the room. And one of the things that the MVIC group knows is that we develop narratives for those objectives to explain what they are and what they are not. So if you have some ideas about the, that doesn't sound right, it's probably because you haven't seen that narrative. We'd be happy to help you with that. What questions could I answer? Are there questions for Mr. Stiegel? My dad's not here. Uh -huh. What's that? You never know. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and the key ones in the increased funding, improved cost management, tie back to what Jennifer was saying in our opportunities in our partnering. So thank you for your time. Oh, now I've got to do his animations because he didn't do it. <laughs> okay. okay. So you can see from the strategy map that Jerry showed you how all this starts fitting together. Uh, there is no panacea for the challenges that we're facing. Again, we're taking a multifaceted approach where we're looking at improving service delivery to our members in the region while expanding the resources to meet the needs that we're seeing. So this evening with this item, staff is looking for your concurrence that we continue on this strategy work to inform us, to explore opportunities that create additional service to, or level of service, uh, additional value uh, to our member governments in the region, diversify our revenue streams, and bring back to you as opportunities and circumstances arise, uh, everything from detailed plans as to how something might look were we to do it, uh, to uh, uh, contracts. So um, I'll turn it back over to the chair and see what questions you have about this item. Okay, so staff is looking for direction and questions regarding this. Is, you know, this is the path they are proceeding on unless they hear differently from us this evening. So are there any questions? Uh, Mayor Atchison, or... I'll share with Phil because I know he's going to ask one too. <laughs> uh, I'm very much in favor of what we're talking about here, but I think one of the things that we talked about earlier uh, in admin committee is also that uh, staff continues to look at opportunities that are brought to us that are not profitable and are not something that we want to take on. So I think that evaluation has to go both ways as we start to look at it. And uh, Jennifer ad advised us of a couple that had come in and they just come with no funding and we can't afford to fund those. So I think that's going to have to be a piece that if something looks like way, and it needs to be a board decision, that'll have to be brought back to us as a board and say, look, even though it comes with no money, it's of such critical nature to the region that we may want to fund it anyway. So I think those are still going to be conversations we'll have in the future. Mr. Sunanik. Mayor Sunanik. Uh... Thank you. Uh, for uh, those that aren't aware, particularly uh, um, uh, I know some are, with, but looking at the care transitions program that we went through, uh, with Jayla and her staff and actually hiring folks to respond to the grant that was there. That was actually ex ex executed with community partners. Uh, and the AAA is a grant organization and in working with our grant partners that's how it was actually uh, pulled together. Um, the question uh, that I have is it's great value to the community and I would probably ask a question I'm not going to ask it but I would hesitate to see more than one hand raised where any community whether it's a county or a municipality uh, believes they have enough money to deal with the next 25 years of services transportation and housing issues that will come up around aging um, and so when Mayor Atchison talks about dealing with that it may require a, a lot of work and trying to understand 
who's the stakeholders that benefit through the aggregation of that and making sure we have conversations at the right level because um, we may be saving the, the overall community uh, something and it could be in quality of life it could be in actual dollars um, but um, and taking a look at uh, some of the bonding approaches that have been used internationally uh, to say how do some of those things get recognized so you can pay for services now. Um, those may be some things, and I don't know if the staff's ready for that, but I would encourage taking a look at some of those options. Thank you. Are there any other comments, questions? Okay, seeing none, I think we're going to move on the agenda to uh, item number... There's no... Well, there's no... Yeah, there, we are proceeding along this path. Um, I didn't see a request for a motion here, but, but if we, let's go ahead and may I have a motion to direct staff to continue on the path with the comments that they received tonight? Second. Can I hear, yeah, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained. Okay. Proceed the course. Um, moving on to agenda item number 10. Discussion of a resolution amending the 2016-2021 <coughs> Transportation Improvement Program, Attachment C in your packet. Todd Cottrell, Senior Transportation Planner. Thank you and good evening. Uh, before you this, uh, this evening, there are three amendments uh, for your consideration. The first is the C-470 Managed Toll Express Lanes Project, sponsored by CDOT Region 1. And Region 1 is requesting an update to this project to reflect more recent projections and align this project with the project that's already in the STIP. Uh, there's two major changes to this project, uh, the first being the project length in which the westbound uh, one tolled express lane will be between uh, I-25 and Wadsworth, and the eastbound lane will be, be approximately Platte Canyon to I-25. The second uh, change is the addition of three funding sources. The next two amendments are connected through one request that was received through RTD. Uh, since RTD will be contracting for the shuttle service but will not be running the actual service itself, uh, RTD is requesting to transfer the CMAC funds out of this project and shift uh, to a new project for RTD to buy four new buses. Uh, RTD will then replace the federal funds from the shuttle project with their local funds. Uh, with that, um, these three amendments all conform to the state uh, implementation plan for air quality. And there's also a revised draft resolution um, in front of you for um, anyone who is looking at an online agenda item only. Um, the draft resolution is actually redlined with any uh, changes that it has. Uh, so if you have any questions or concerns, I'd be happy to answer those. Questions for Mr. Cottrell? Seeing none, I think I would look for a motion. So yes, sir, oh, excuse me, Mayor Rakowski. No, I was going to Oh, vote. okay. M Mayor Atchison <coughs> moved, and I believe Mayor Rakowski will second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Okay, we all want to get home for the debate. All right, moving on to action item, agenda item number 11, discussion of federal legislative issues, attachment D in your packet. Mr. Doug Rex, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations. Great, thank you very much, Madam in Chair. In his Bronco colors, I see. Yeah, I know. There was an email going around today that uh, <laughs> around the office that everybody was, was asked to wear their Bronco colors tomorrow, and of course, and there was a little note, I'm a cheese fan, by the way, <laughs> and there was a note in there, Doug, you cannot wear a Kansas City cheese fan, Dick here. And I, I shot back and said, well, you guys might, might want to wear it tomorrow because I don't feel, I don't think you're going to want to wear it on Friday. So <laughs> that's, about how, well it, that's oh. about how well it went over. I think we've heard enough from Mr. Rex. Is there anyone else? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my. Save those comments till the end. Yeah, isn't that the truth? <laughs> well, who, who's that? He was indeed, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Well, here we go. Let's go, Doug. Federal issues. Well, I wanted, we wanted to bring your attention today um, just a couple federal issues that we're, we're, we're closely monitoring. Um, 
particularly one to, to the federal authorization and another related to air quality, in particular the ozone standard. Um, the first uh, revolves around the DRIVE Act, um, and if those who are not familiar with f the federal reauthorization process, um, we've been without a bill now since September of last year. We've been on continuing resolution. Um, the current continuing resolution expires on October 29th. Uh, it is anticipated, I think, by many that there will be an extension, hopefully a short CR to the end of the calendar year to for, uh, for, for the legislature to get their work done on, on a new reauthorization bill. But what I wanted to talk about specifically with you tonight is the DRIVE Act, which is the Senate version, which was passed um, on July 29th. Um, and I'll preface my comments, excuse me, I'll preface my comments um, by just saying that, you know, we know that there's going to be a lot of changes, a lot of debates between, with this, with this current uh, Senate bill once the House starts marking up their own and I'm sure they will consider the drive back but I think they it's it's pretty clear that they intend on introducing their own bill and beginning markup as um, as early as the end of this month um, into the early part of, um, of um, October um, and you know we of course will be following the uh, the debate in the House very closely but this makes this as an opportune time to really have a discussion and bring back to our delegation and others um, issues, critical issues that we may have with the with the with the Drive Act, so that some changes possibly can be made in the in the final in the final um, final uh, authorization bill. Um, and a critical issue, and and the reason why we pen the attached attached draft letter has to do with uh, with how demographic data is being used within the Drive Act uh, as it relates to uh, the allocation of formula funds and, 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 and ultimately the sub-allocation of those funds to the Dr. Cog area. Um, the Act as it's currently drafted would use uh, basically MAP-21 funding formulas uh, utilizing 2000 census information um, to calculate how, how much money is distributed to, to, the, uh, to the states. Um, obviously, in an area which is fast growing, such as ourselves, um, we don't believe that this is. Uh, that w we believe they should be using the most recent, greatest information that 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 they that they can that they that they can get their hands on. That being, of course, the 2010 decennial census. At least there's also, of course, uh, other estimates, um, the American Community Survey and the like, which are census products. They do provide estimates into the the, the current year. So uh, we would also strongly encourage that just, just because, again, we know that we're, we're growing at a, at a pretty uh, good clip. In particular, um, the state of Colorado and Dr. Cog, we kind of marry each other with regards to growth through about 16, 17 percent since 2000 um, to 2010. And then we actually are seeing a, a, a rate of growth after 2010 even uh, uh, accelerating at a higher clip at about 1.7 percent annually, so as opposed to 1.45 in the first 10 years, so that's significant, and it's all about um, you know uh, you know equity, fairness, um, making sure that um, that the people within the, state, the great state of Colorado are getting their their fair share. Um, I, I should also mention that this is just not us that are there, what that's voicing this. Jennifer's been working very closely. Um, and collaborating with our sister agencies in throughout the western states, in particular um, Phoenix and, and uh, Las Vegas, as well as others as part of uh, the regional, Western Regional Alliance that we belong to, um, to, to raise this issue with their delegations as well. And I believe Florida has even been involved to some degree as well. So it, this, is, this is growing importance, um, uh, and, we, and we believe that we have pretty, pretty good standing to, to bring this to our delegation. Um, so I'll just... The other, I don't know if I should take your comments on that now or before we move on. Yes. Yeah, I actually would like to take comments regarding the the uh, transportation letter right now, and then we'll move on to the other issue because there is a specific letter in the packet. Hopefully, everyone has an, had an opportunity to take a look at it. So, Mayor Crispin. Okay, I talked to Doug about this, um, so I'm not going to surprise him <laughs> with this comment. Um, we start our letter with thank you for your leadership as you continue to deliberate. We'd like to share a concern with you. That is way too nice. <laughs> <laughs> this is, in my opinion, a justice and equity issue. 
we are effectively by the federal government is going to ignore over a, approximately at this juncture over a million of our residents and they don't count they do count they're also voters there isn't a single person in our delegation right or left for whom this shouldn't be a significant and important issue our citizens are being cheated if we don't address this we need to make that really clear and we need to make sure that our and we're all officials here that our constituents know if our delegation does not cross the aisle work together work with other governments and get this done it's their dollars and they need to come here and I'm sorry if there are other states that haven't grown not my problem <laughs> so um, I would like to change this letter <laughs> that's my comment thank you any other thoughts councilmember Teal thank you madam chairman well I mean I I, I just wanted to speak in support of uh, the the content of the letter I think the the crux of it being if we go by the 2000 census then yes I'm I may uh, I represent a community where we're cut in half because in 2000 we were running at about uh, 23,000 we're at 58,000 now so um, now making it more tough and you know the good mayor wants to bat him around the head and neck hey that's cool by me but I really I think the the crux the the meat and potatoes that we see in the center uh, paragraph I would definitely like to see that there and I have no objection to that being verbatim Mayor Rakowski I have learned to more and more respect the wisdom of my counterpart <laughs> to the village to the north our one of our significant suburbs and so I uh, <laughs> I just see if you guys are paying attention. Mayor, uh, I I think uh, we're not going to sit next to each other. Next to each that's right. <laughs> I I really think uh, Mayor Christman has hit it, and it's time to stop being Miss Nice Guy in terms of the executive director, and to, not that she isn't uh, capable of being tough, but I think this is one where it's time. I, in fact, I think that there may even be a possibility if they stay with the 2000 data that we may have standing to sue. Are there any other additional? Yeah, uh, Commissioner uh, Henry. Eva. Eva. <laughs> Commissioner Eva. <laughs> I, um, I kind of agree. Uh, we're, we're running into the 2016 elections. Colorado is going to be the highlight um, of every campaign on both sides of the aisle. And I think we need to kind of urge the importance of, of this. So I, I definitely think we should make the language just a little bit stronger. I don't think we need to call them right out on it, but I do think we need, we need to make it stronger and make them understand that, you know, we are voters out here and, you know, there's over, you know, three million people in this area. So I, I think that they need to pay attention to it and I really really think we need to make the, the language a little stronger just because of the simple fact let's take advantage of the 2016 election let's put it out there I am seeing a lot of head nods are there any other members that would like to comment uh, the executive director does have some comments so I'm gonna let her go ahead I, I, oh I I'm excuse me real quick your your hand was being hidden by that cowboy hat <laughs> in, <laughs> stand up <laughs> stand up. I, I don't need to do that um, uh, on this um, I'm particularly troubled with the expecting continuing resolution on this and not addressing that at the same point in time uh, because uh, a continuing resolution of the same dollars or roughly the same um, is problematic because it's short-term money and short-term money is not the same value as a, a long-term dollar and every time they go through a continuing resolution and there might be a uh, whether you include it as a postscript or something but it should be included in the reference that a true long-term solution is one of those things that will will be a much more effective and efficient dollar than a continuing resolution dollar oh 
Chrissy or Ms. Fanganello. I'm just going to echo what Mayor Shenanik is saying. I, I think not saying something about the funding and the funding levels and the importance of this bill just to get it done. And Doug and I chatted about this a little bit already. It, it's so important. And, and I think if we're silent on it, that that's bad for us. Anyone else? Are there any other comments? Okay, Jennifer. Yeah, well, I'll first speak to Phil's comment. I, I think it's a good idea to put information in there or, or a position on adopting a long-term bill. I, I think it's pretty much in the cards, though, that we're going to get a, a continuing resolution through December. The Senate actually has already buckled on this and said, you know, they can live with a, a short-term CR, but we will put that language in there. And I just want to clarify, I did not write this letter. Doug is a Canadian, and he, he wrote the letter, and he wanted to start it out by saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so I, I, think, I think Doug has received his fair share of abuse for tonight. Uh, I am can, can we have a vote on that? No, we may not. Um, so I am I'm hearing support for strengthening the language regarding the inequities associated with the uh, funding formula and uh, using the old census data and uh, the lo uh, providing a long-term solution to um, our transportation funding problem. Uh, if, if there is a motion uh, for that and then um, uh, I, would a I would ask staff to have the executive committee review the letter uh, because I don't think this body will be meeting so again. So moved. Well, uh, excuse me. I should, should, uh, you have to wait till I call on you, Mayor. <laughs> you just have to. I know it's hard. I know it's hard for you. Do, do we want our uh, chair to sign this letter as well or just the executive director? Um, well, I will let you know that um, Elise and I will be delivering this letter along with uh, Mayor Christman's message. Uh, to the to our um, to our uh, representatives in Washington, um, and I, I think historically the executive director has been the signatory on the letter. I have no problem putting my name on it as well, and I would the leave reason, that to I the body. I think you should have the name on it just because it represents us, the, the elected, right. not just her who represents Dr. Cog. I mean, we all do, but if we're going to be firm about the letter and we're serious, then the elected should be represented on that letter. Okay, and. and then I would look for a motion to, for, for the strengthening of the language and then including the um, chair's signature on the letter. And uh, Commissioner Partridge. I would suggest all signatures. Do you see that coming from representatives and senators all the time? All signatures. Yes. Oh, the, every do. member of the body? Yes. Do, right. Let's talk about the logistics associated with doing that. And, and do, you, do you all have an... Uh, um, electronic signature that you could forward. So anyone who would like their name to be on the letter, I would ask that you please send your electronic signature to Connie by the end of, when, when are we, we don't have a date on this. We are leaving September 28th, so Connie, you tell me. When, by next Wednesday, a week from today, which will be the 23rd. Okay, so if you would like your signature on this letter, um, and if we don't get enough signatures, you guys, um, I don't think it makes sense to send them. So if we don't get enough signatures by the 23rd, I'm going to ask you to leave it to the discretion of the chair. Um, and define would be two-thirds of our body is what I would suggest. If we don't have that, two-thirds of our body, it's not going to look that effective. It's going to look like what happened to the rest of them. Do they not care enough? So, um, so I will leave it to uh, Commissioner Jones. I'm just wondering if we can cut out the logistics and have your signature signing on behalf and just list all our names. Yes. It's going to save somebody yes. a Perfect. whole yes. lot of time. Yes. You're a thinker. Yes. You're a thinker, Commissioner. Work on the so, yeah. <laughs> all right. So given the improved, I like this group thinking dynamic that's happening here. So, all right. I'm looking for a motion to strengthen the language. Everyone is clear on the motion. Second. Okay. Excuse me, uh, Councilmember Spoltzman. I have one question about the motion. Does it allow the executive committee to approve the letter once it's done? That, uh, yes, that, would be, that was what the intention was, that the executive committee would take a look at the letter prior to my signing it on behalf of all of you. <laughs> so with that caveat, uh, I think I had a who – made the mo who made the motion? Mayor Cernanek and Councilmember Pfeiffer seconded or Mayor – Atchison seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstained? 
Okay. Uh, now we are going to move on to the ozone discussion. So uh, with that, Mr. Rex, please continue. Thank air you very quality. much. Um, I think most will recall that Ken Lloyd, the Executive Director of the Regional Air Quality Council. I think Ken, yeah, Ken's here. Ken might want to even comment and help me through this. Um, gave a presentation to the board back in, back in July. Uh, and he, at that time, he kind of relayed kind of the state of ozone within, within our region and, uh, and talked about the continuing problem that we, that we have in meeting the current federal ozone standard of 75 parts per billion. Um, in fact, it's anticipated uh, that EPA will be bumping up our, our, uh, our non-attainment designation from marginal to moderate here in the, here in the near future, which, which uh, will trigger um, a, a revision to the state implementation plan. Additionally, uh, Ken mentioned the EP that, on, that EPA on or before October 1st will announce the new standard, the revised standard for ozone, um, and is expected to be in the range of 65 to 70 parts per billion. Um, and you know, our biggest concern really with, with ozone in general um, really has to do what we believe is somewhat of a failure um, of um, a a fa failure to have an, a, a, an adequate, adequate discussion about the whole transport issue, or background ozone, which comes from naturally occurring ozone as well as transport. Transport is the big issue that, that we see that is coming from other states as well as, quite frankly, other countries. Um, and it represents 60 to 80 percent of, of ozone precursors on uh, high ozone days within our region. So it's, it's a very significant problem. Um, and, and again, it's not even really so much related to, to any, any particular standard. Um, it's more, in my mind, Ken, you can probably correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it's more of a Clean Air Act problem, right? I mean, I don't think anybody, the Clean Air Act is, is 25 years old now, and I don't think they ever anticipated that as a percent of total that transport would be this much of an issue. Um, so it, it becomes very difficult for regions when you're looking at 60 to 80 percent of the problems that you have are not generated within your region to actually be able to mitigate effectively the problem. Um, I would suggest, this is just me personally, this is, you know, it's more than just a regional problem, obviously. This is a national, if not international, issue that, um, that we really got to get a handle on. So I just wanted to point that out, but, it, but the transport issue itself also does have an have a unintended consequence for our, for our area. Um, as it relates to the new ozone standard, I'll just pop up this slide real quick that, sh that Ken showed um, a couple months ago, that based on the, the revised standard, the range that they're talking about, if it's 65 to 70 uh, parts per billion, we are going to have a number of new non-attainment areas with, throughout the country, a number. Uh, if it's 70 parts per billion, now granted this data is this, this data is a little old, but but it suits the purposes for 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 our uh, for our discussion this evening. Um, 358 counties would violate this 70 parts per billion. An additional 200 uh, would vi would violate at um, at 65. And the reason I raise that is that there is going to be um, there's going to be a lot of areas that are now eligible for CMAQ monies. So it has the potential of having a significant impact on, on our transportation program, specifically our congestion mitigation air quality program. Um, as a result, um, because the CMAQ program, it's, it's a finite pot of money, right? And unless you know something that I don't, I don't expect there's going to be a tremendous increase in that CMAQ pot. So it's going to be redistributed, and as a result, there could be some worthwhile projects within this region um, in the years to come that are not going to get funded. So it's, it's something that we just wanted to throw out there to make sure you guys are aware. Um, we will certainly carry this message um, when we go to, to, to D.C., um, to, and, you know, when we talk to our delegation. It's, it's an issue, transport in general, that has to be dealt with. Other questions regarding this or comments? I have some, <laughs> and, uh, and I will defer my comments as chair. I saw Commissioner Jones raise her hand. I think she knows what I'm going to say. I, I'm only talking because you're talking. Uh, you know it. <laughs> um, I just think um, you raised two very valid points about implementation um, of air quality standards. 
and the impacts that we'll feel locally. I think it's important to distinguish those implementation problems from the underlying purpose of the Clean Air Act and the purpose of setting a health-based standard. Um, I would hate for our region to articulate a stance that would um, come across as us being in opposition to having cleaner air. The, you know, there are studies now that can calculate the number of deaths that will be prevented if we do further cleanup of our air, that millions of decreased visits to emergency rooms because we, have, we will have less asthma attacks you know, among our children and other vulnerable populations. Those translate into huge healthcare dollars, which is why implementation of a stronger standard has a net economic value nationally when you look at the numbers. So I just think it's important if we are articulating where we stand as a body that we focus on encouraging the EPA to help figure out how do we calculate and address the transport issue, encourage our congressional delegation to increase the funding available to communities that are trying to clean up their, our air, but that we stay in favor of clean air for our region, both for public health and for our, our economic prosperity. Uh, Councilmember Teal. I really don't disagree too much with uh, the Commissioner's assertion that we want to be in favor of clean air. That's very much a no-brainer. Uh, that's kind of the reason why we all live here in Colorado. But we must have an emphasis on the background um, uh, measures there. You know, when we look at this map, I don't know if anybody of you have ever tried driving across that light blue area of Wyoming. <laughs> You have? Yeah. How many cows did you almost hit <laughs> as opposed to automobiles being passed? So I mean that's the point is that there's background issues that we have as a, as a, and we've heard testimony about this in this body by the way, that we as western states have vulnerabilities in terms of the background levels of ozone that are just naturally occurring. So I would like to see that expressed as well that, you know, do we need a second standard? Do we need to have exception standards? Um, I don't know that I know that answer, but we have a unique situation that this, that these new regulations do not take into effect. Are there any other comments? Mayor Sunanik. Mine's just a question, which is, um, it seems that it's very difficult to get to attainment levels. Um, and I just want to know, what would it take to get to the attainment levels? You know, what's it, what's it going to cost? What's the impact to actually achieve these? Which gets to uh, Representative or Council Member Teal's point, which is if we don't know what it's going to take, if it indeed is background, it's not indeed. It is background. I mean, that's well, the I, testimony that it. <laughs> well, that's what I said. It, you know, if it if it can't be achieved, if we actually have to bring in another planet or something like that, that is just not achieved. You know, not uh, a, a practical piece. You know, it's that the problem with some of the the EPA requirements from from our perspective, and we have a wastewater treatment to get to some of the downstream impacts that they want us to do. We actually would have to actually go into the river, not our wastewater treatment, we'd actually have to go in the river and treat the river water because the background ground level is contributing to it. So it's, it's one of those things where if it's impossible to attain, it's, it's one of those things where they're not looking at what some of the practical aspects. And uh, as it's pointed out here, um, the atmosphere drifts and it collects in different places and that's where some of this issue is if you look at where that basin is relative to where the Rocky Mountains are. Yeah. Anyone else care to make a comment? Well, I'm going to make a comment and then I'll allow the body an opportunity to, to comment again. So I think it's extremely important that this region aggressively pursue the cleanest air possible. But I think the facts also are important right now. The fact is that we are not me meeting the current 2008 standard. The fact is that we have already moved up to 
from uh, to a moderate attainment level. The fact is that we are already drafting um, a state implementation plan to address the 2008 standard. This, and we're not doing it, and we're not meeting it, and at our recent RAC meeting, and Ken, I will ask you to correct me if I am misspeaking, because this is very important, and if I am misspeaking, I need to, I need to be corrected, and I need to have a proper understanding that at our recent um, Regional Air Quality Council meeting, one of the board members, uh, or council members, asked the executive director, um, gee, what are, what are these other communities that didn't get bumped up? What are they doing? How come, how did they not move to the moderate level? And, um, and the executive director responded, look, we're doing everything. It's kind of on our list. And, and the expectation is that our air quality will improve. Um, because of the things that we are doing. But the fact is, we're not meeting the 2008 standard. I have a real concern with the EPA imposing a more strict standard um, when we're doing everything that we can think of right now to achieve this, and 60 to 80 percent of the problem is being created elsewhere that we have absolutely no control over. Uh, I think the CMAC, uh, congestion mitigation air quality dollars that come to this organization are extremely important and we do very valuable good work to make the improvements that we have been making with the ozone. Uh, the population is here in this region. Um, the people that are going to be, the most people that are going to be impacted is the deterioration of this air quality here. If we don't get those CMAC dollars, and those CMAC dollars will have to be shared throughout the region because I do think it's unrealistic to think the federal government is going to be giving us any more money. I think the impacts on this region, the health on this region, are is going to be even greater. And I do think that this body has an obligation to let our federal legislators know that this isn't okay, um, that this transport issue must be addressed. And, and I think they have an obligation to present that information to their partners at the federal level and say, you know, stop the insanity here. We're not meeting the current standard. Um, please address this transport issue before you make the standard even stronger. But we are always in the Denver region going to aggressively pursue having the cleanest air quality. That is an important, essential, vital um, element of what makes this the great region and state that we are. Um, when our air quality wasn't good, things in this area were not good, and I don't think any of us wants deterioration, and I don't think any of us want any more children going to ERs or anything else, but if we don't have the money to spend in this region, there will be more kids in this region going because we have to share those dollars, and we will have less bang for that buck. So I would like to see this body write a letter. Mayor Atchison. Yeah, just kind of staying in line with, with what we're facing even today, the transport that we get penalized for, as, as the chair and others have said many times, is not something that's coming from us. And unfortunately, as dire as it is, if we look at California and Washington State, look at what's been happening to our atmosphere, our air quality here, that we're being judged on and penalized that had nothing to do with us but the smoke and particulates that come, unfortunately, from the forest fires and sage fires that are going on west of us. Now, we have some of that here as well, mm -hmm. but we get penalized because it came to us and it's passing through us. But that's not only just from the west. We have the same thing in reverse when the stuff comes from the east. And, and as George pointed out, some of it comes from the north, but if they'd like to stop state then we'll just quit raising beef, and then the East won't have any, and we'll quit worrying about background on that area because it's just common things. It, it happens as part of nature. I'm sorry, but it does. And there, there's not a lot we can do about many of these issues. They're beyond our control. And even Mother Nature doesn't help us in some cases. But to look at the reality of penalizing this portion of the country, especially Colorado and our, some of our neighbors, on things that they're just not going to happen. You can put all the penalties you want, but until you can stop things like goes on in California and Washington right now, it's ludicrous to keep telling us that we've got to do more and spend more money that we don't have. And we have no way of solving the problem to start with. So I have, uh, I have, oh, 
Shakti, or I, 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 I'm sorry, Commissioner Partridge, Council Member Stoltz, Shakti, and then Mayor Rakowski. So, Commissioner. Madam Chair, since one of the uh, solutions to pollution is dilution, and by the looks of the map, I suggest maybe we consider annexing Nebraska and <laughs> Colorado. <laughs> Oh, that it's not a state enough. issue, it's a regional issue, oh, so it won't help us, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, yeah. my comments is, a, is certainly is a, no doubt a challenge whenever you uh, go to discuss issues with the EPA and any of our federal bureaucracy, I'm going to put it that way. Uh, and noting what has been happened, what had recently happened with the waters of the U.S., it took actually the Attorney General's getting involved to get in any type of action. And, Madam Chair, I know you're, you're very instrumental. I think all of us have been very instrumental with clean water, and we were very, very active on that. And our whole, all our counties and cities were very active. And to see that it took the Attorney General to get some action. Wondering is on your trip back to D.C. if it's consideration, some of the other key states, some of the other key representatives and senators that represent those areas that are not in attainment, maybe that be some discussion is to say, that's just maybe another way to take a take a look at it to get get the attention to EPA. Thank you, Councilmember Stoltzman. Thank you very much. I just want to start by saying I agree with uh, Commissioner Jones's comments that I think it is really important if we do choose to write a letter that we're clear that we value air quality in our region and that if we're going to make um, ozone ranges that are important for people's health that we support that and we think that that's very valuable. Um, I, I've been listening to this discussion and part of me is a little bit conflicted because if we think that this is all out of our control, um, I have a hard time asking for more CMAQ funding if we can't do anything. That seems incredibly wasteful to me. So maybe it is important to think, you know, we talk about regionalism a lot of the time. Maybe we do need to think of this nationally and some of our nationalism and suggest sort of what Commissioner Jones was saying, that there are big implementation problems and we need help beyond just our region to be able to solve our ozone problem. Councilmember Shakti. Uh, I would agree. I, uh, I mean, if we look at the, the item in our agenda, the first paragraph that's talking about transportation, I think we should write a letter on that and that makes sense. And um, But this broader discussion of um, should the what level be lowered and um, should there be a thinking about who's going to get the money when we're deciding if the level should be lowered I, I think um, I'm not nearly as clear that I would agree with that 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 to instead have them be health-based standards has some logic to it but I think if we narrow it to the issue of transport that would really go a long way in addressing our problems, and I, I don't hear anyone disagreeing with that. So, Mayor, Mayor Rakowski, and then I'll go to Mayor Gerland. Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Partridge uh, is hit the nail on the head on Rivers of America Act, and the way that got done was the Colorado Attorney General, in conjunction with 12 other attorneys general, uh, went to federal court. Uh, you can write a letter to whoever you want, good luck. The only thing that gets action is the law, and that's why we have federal courts. And again, I think it goes uh, in the spirit of, I mean, you can write the letter to uh, the Attorney General, which is what I would suggest, with a copy to EPA saying, here's what's coming. When you take standards that are just uh, defy common sense. Mayor Gerland. Joe, how do you say your last name? Gerland? Am I saying it right? Gerlich. Gerlach. Gerlach. I Everybody in my apologize. family pronounces it differently. <laughs> okay. Um, but, but I just had a quick question. Um, whether this topic was addressed in the governor's uh, climate action plan that he's been drafting this summer and do we have any leverage with the state as opposed to you know the the Denver metro region directly interacting with the federal government without state support I don't I don't I, yeah I uh, I can I don't know if 
Okay, did you hear, the, uh, Mr. Lloyd? Did you hear the question? And do you know? Do you have a? Do you know what impact? Thanks, Ken. Poor Ken. <laughs> It was either the Republican debate or the Dr. Cox. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> this is very entertaining. Um, well, the question was about the Clean Power Plan, and that doesn't have any direct relationship to this. Um, first of all, the um, plan hasn't been developed. It will be developed over the next three years. There are co-benefits of that plan that will help us with with um, ozone down the road in terms of reducing our power consumption, going to renewables and um, things like that. But there's no direct link between the clean power plan and, and the ozone plan at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Henry and then Deborah. I, this is kind of where I'm, where I'm coming from with, when, in regards to the Clean Water Act and the EPA. What was happening with that is that all their studies on rivers were done in eastern United States. And we know that our rivers here in the western United States are totally different. And I think this is what's going on with the Clean Air Act also is that, let's, be, let's just face facts, in Washington, D.C., those who actually develop the policies are the ones that, that have gone to eastern colleges. They grew up in the eastern area, and they don't really understand a, of anything west of the Mississippi. So I think instead of, you know, addressing the, the actual issues of what's, what's coming up, I think we really need to start asking our senators and our Congress, and I think we need to go to the EPA and start asking them to start doing studies in the western United States when it comes to our environment. Because here in the western United States, we have a different environment than they do in the eastern United States. And I think we need to start asking those questions. Are they actually looking at the western United States when they make these rulings? Um, or are they just looking into the United eastern United States. As far as the letter goes, I think that maybe we should leave that up to individual communities if they choose to send a letter or not. I don't think as a Dr. Cog body, this might be one of those decisive um, decisions that might be a little too much for our, our region in a whole. I think we should be doing it individually in individual cities. Um, it's a value. It's a value vote is basically what it is. And some, some communities might have a problem by going up against uh, the EPA when it comes to clean air. That's just an opinion. Ms. Perkins-Smith. Uh, Chairman Lay, may I direct a question to Ken again? Of course. Well, if Ken doesn't mind, I don't. <laughs> so um, I have two things I wanted to talk about, and it's more in relationship to the facts as opposed to what we should do. So Ken, there was a lot of discussion, I don't, I don't know if you caught it, in terms of transport, but I remember at the RAC board, I thought that you said most of the transport is actually coming from overseas. Yes, a lot of it comes off the coast. So coming from, it's a ozone that's coming through California and ending up here. So, so that's part of it. I mean, natural background is is part of it, but it's it's not a huge part. Um, stuff coming from other states that's part of it as 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 unwell. So, but yeah. That's, the, that's what our modeling shows. So, so although we've had some very specific incidents lately, now are those also included um, when we look at levels, or does the EPA allow that special event and dis discard that data? Well, there is an impact from, wild, from wildfires. Oh, yes. It can both be positive and negative, the, um, the impending on the, where the fire occurs. But um, EPA does have an exceptional events policy which you can which you can exclude data now it's very burdensome very cumbersome so that needs to be more straightforward with you know with areas in order for us to be able to to um, to amuse that so okay thank you I, I think the point I was I wanted to make was that um, you know, the transport is not just coming from within the United States. So no matter what you do here, you still can't affect it. So that's one thing. I'm, so I'm just talking about facts. The other thing is I do want to talk about the funding a little bit. So in terms of the federal funding, um, it's also for other pollutants as well. So for Colorado, it's ozone and PM10. And based on that, um, there's a complicated formula from the feds, and it's more based on population, not geographic area. So I wanted you to be aware of that. So um, we would get it more based on the population of where this is occurring. 
And then, just so that you're aware, it is up to, it comes to the state DOTs, and then it is up to the state DOT how that money is used, although it needs to be used within the non-attainment areas. So in Colorado, our um, process for doing that is based on a formula so that Dr. Cog ends up with most of that money. It does also go to some other PM10 locations. But that is not necessarily the case in other states. It could be the state DOT selects the projects and that's it. So I do want you to be aware that that's not a federal requirement and it's something that is um, specific to our state in terms of how that's, that's done and that could change in the future, just so you're aware of it. Okay, I don't want to beat a dead horse, so I'm going to suggest this, and if nobody would like to make the motion, it's going to die. So I, I would like to send a letter saying that we do value air quality and that um, health-based standards are important, but we have a concern about uh, lowering the standard without addressing the transport issue. And I, I think uh, the executive director raised a good point that the exclusionary, the process to get an exclusion is very cumbersome and difficult to deal with and that also should be addressed to, so we can have the opportunity when we have these catastrophic events to exclude that. So, and that process is not clean and simple. So if there's no takers on that, we, we, we will move on. Okay, uh, motion and second. So all of those in favor of drafting a letter with those, that caveat. And I would argue this is a controversial issue. I would like it to come back to the board before it is sent because um, I want everyone to see it. But, um, but all those in favor, please raise their hand. All those opposed? Abstained? Okay, the motion passes. So I, I'd like I'd like uh, I'd like to get that drafted and back to us at the next meeting. Um, and I will I will let you know that given the vote this evening, I do believe it is appropriate for me to make the comment when we are back there that there is a concern by this body that the transport issue has not been addressed. So I will be making that statement. Okay, with that, we are moving on to informational briefings. Ashley Summers, our IS manager from Administration and Finance, is going to give us a presentation on Denver Regional Visual Resources. Where Great. are you? Thank oh, you. There you are. Right here. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, in lieu of a presentation, I'm going to do a live demo, so cross your fingers and hold your breath. Okay. Just kidding. Uh, I'm actually very proud to demo this site for you tonight. It's a new section of the Dr. Cog website called um, DRIVER, which stands for Denver Regional Visual Resources. And as the name suggests, it's a place to find information about our region that is illustrated in a compelling way. So let me just explain a little bit more about what this site is designed to do. It's an online repository of data-driven stories and infographics that explain the state of our region. Our main topic areas right now, as you can see, focus on economics and land use, uh, com uh, community profiles, travel and transportation, and aging. The framework that we've built, however, will allow us to add in other topics of interest uh, as they arise. So we foresee being able to use this site as a way to bring awareness to the MetroVision 2040 plan as it's adopted. Also, let me explain why we did this. Uh, internally, Dr. Cog deals with a lot of data, as you know. And while it's serving our purposes right now to inform our work, we suspected that there was more potential there, that we were under, underutilizing its power. With a little more effort and with this site, we can be more transparent and turn data into information that can be explored by a much wider audience, including you and your staff and the public. It's also a great way to advertise the value of Dr. Cog and the importance of regional collaboration on many issues in these key topic areas. The goals of DRIVER are, number one, to explain issues quickly and clearly, providing a common basis for discussion, and to inform decision making. Uh, all of this through the use of interactive 
and engaging visualization and tools. So before I go any further, let me actually show you uh, one of these visualiza visualizations so you get an understanding of what we've been creating over the past year. The one I want to focus on right now is about mode share. It's called, How Does the Denver Region Get to Work? And this is a story that we're telling about the Denver Region from a variety of perspectives. So we start out looking at the, the Denver Region over time and show our mode share split from the 60s to the present day. And then as we walk through this story, we take a deeper dive to see the local insight. So we can look at different types of modes and uh, their prevalence throughout the region, where people are most likely to take transit, where we have more carpoolers, where we have more cyclists to commute to work, et cetera. And you can see as we interact with these graphics, the graphs and charts change. So we're getting information on the top cities and counties that are utilizing these different modes as we interact with this graphic. We also have the opportunity in this dashboard to look at uh, specific jurisdictions and see what their mode share split is. So you can really get lost on this page for quite some time. But once you're done looking at the local context, then we continue the story and we zoom back out and look at the Denver region in a national context and how we compare to other major metropolitan areas. And then finally, we end this story by taking a look at the future. And this is a really great way for us to showcase some Dr. Cog data that we haven't traditionally distributed widely because it's been difficult to show. So this look at the future is showing uh, trips throughout the day. This is a result of our travel model and again, something that we haven't traditionally distributed, but now we can show visually as we move through time, uh, right now we're looking at uh, a typical day and the trips made throughout the day, starting in 2010. And as we move through time, we use the travel model's predictions to show uh, how many trips are going to be made throughout the day until we make it to 2040 and we can very quickly see that uh, noon in 2040 is going to feel like rush hour does today. Mm. And so we leave this story with a powerful message uh, that's very quick and easy to interact with that uh, the work that, that you all are doing here and, uh, and that we do as, doc as part of Dr. Cog is, is very important uh, because this is an issue that it's, uh, that it's important for us to address. So that's just a very quick look at one of the visualizations. We have several others that I won't get into um, right now, but there, we have several in economics and land use that uh, address population and job trends. Uh, that look at our employment centers. We have recreated the community profiles, which you might remember uh, were always a, a printed PDF, and now they're an interactive graphic so that you can uh, quickly page through or query through different jurisdictions and see how their demographics change. And we also have several in travel and transportation that um, focus on uh, crashes on our roadways, uh, tip projects, traffic counts, et cetera, as well as a few in aging that show uh, the, how the aging population is affecting our region. So these are just a few visualizations that we're starting with. This site, as I said, has been in production for over a year, or has been in development for over a year, and we are ready to go into production very soon. Uh, we plan to launch uh, in early October, but before we do that, we want to get some feedback from our primary stakeholders, which would be you and your staff. So. If you have seen anything interesting here that you would like to engage with, we'd like to invite you to participate as a beta tester for a soft launch that we're doing in the next week, uh, where we'd like you to take a look at the site and kick the tires a little bit on it before we uh, roll this out to the public. Uh, would anyone, uh, could I see a show of hands for, for anyone who would yeah. be interested? Wonderful. Um, I will be sending around a sign-in sheet, and please feel free to, uh, or not a sign-in sheet, but a sign-up sheet. Um, so please feel free to um, sign up for that and volunteer any of your staff also that you'd like to be a part of this, and we will contact them in the next couple of days with uh, a link and a brief survey about your experience on this site. Are there any questions? Questions for Ms. Summers? Seeing none, other than it's a very cool tool, so great work. Thank you. Um, and uh, the circulating sheet is going around, so if you're interested, please make sure you, you uh, sign up before you leave. Okay, we are moving on to our committee reports, and, and I am going to request 
that they be brief and reflect decisions made and information germane to the business of Dr. Cog, uh, Elise Jones, the State Transportation Advisory Committee. So uh, we had another staff meeting where there wasn't really any action taken. We just got um, briefings on um, the Freight Advisory Committee, um, federal legislation similar to what we heard tonight, um, incident management, CDOT's Road X project, and Bustang. So if anybody is interested in any of those topics, come see me. Thank you, Elise. Okay, report from Metro Mayor's Caucus. Mayor Horn, are you... Uh, <laughs> your last report. Your last May. report. Um, so we didn't meet this month. We will be meeting October 7th. And I did want to also let everyone know um, December 9th is our joint legislative reception with the Metro Mayors and the Metro Area County Commissioners. And I would urge anyone who is able to to attend that. It's a wonderful opportunity to see your colleagues um, across the Metro Mayors, the County Commissioners, and legislators who attend. Um, and I would also just like to let you know that Vice Chair, I'm certainly currently serving as Chair of the Metro Mayors Caucus, so that too will end at the end of the month. And Vice Chair Heidi Williams of Thornton will um, be stepping in for that last meeting in the legislative reception. And last but not least, I forgot to invite you all to come down to Orlando. I'll leave forwarding information <laughs> with um, with Dr. Cog, so that'll be available. Right yeah, and you know, Disney World, the whole night. <coughs> that, that was said with this uh, humming of "It's a Small World." Yeah, no, I think it's the and, Book and of people Mormon. Are, people Orlando. are kind of signing up, so you know. <laughs> okay, with that, we're going to move on to. Um, Report of the Metro Area County Commissioners, Commissioner Don Rogier. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to defer to Commissioner Partridge as I was absent at that meeting and he was there since it was in Douglas County. I hope he was there. Yes, <laughs> yes it was. Thank you, Commissioner Rozier. Uh, we had an a excellent uh, presentation regarding the uh, county jail, sheriff's office, justice center, and thank you to uh, representing some Boulder County, County and I believe Adams County. I think it was there. So, uh, great discussion of just our challenges regarding law enforcement and incarceration and our judicial system. So, it was really wonderful because it's a, a challenge for us all. But I think, from a standpoint uh, nationally wise, it, we do a great job and it was a, a very good w uh, and well attended, well, it could have been better attended, but. <laughs> <laughs> You'll take what you got. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, moving <laughs> on to report yeah. from the Advisory Committee on Aging, Jayla Sanchez Warren. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Brad Calvert came and spoke with the Aging Advisory Committee about Boomer Bond, gave us an update. You know, Boomer Bond originated um, from a Livable Communities Committee that was a subcommittee of aging, um, and, and Mayor Noon was on back way back in the early days. Um, uh, they were very happy to hear the success we got to hear um, all the the communities that have participated and have already gone through it and some of the changes that have happened as a result of going through that process and and I don't know if we told you this before but uh, the city and county of Denver agreed um, to go through Boomer Bond and um, we're very excited about that and we're working with the Denver Office on Aging to make that happen so that's that's a huge success for for us um, we also then talked about quite a bit about transportation. Um, we've made we made some changes in our contractors that provide our transportation services, and uh, it didn't go as smoothly as we hoped. And we had some um, big concerns, uh, particularly in Arapahoe County, uh, service not uh, being provided the way that that we wanted it to be provided. And uh, so we talked about. Uh, how we're going, we're addressing those issues and how we will continue it to address those issues and really trying to keep the, the advisory committee who made those funding decisions um, or, or, or recommended them to you and you all approved them, uh, they, they take that very seriously, that work very seriously. And so uh, we're having our, our contractor come in and talk to us about their plans to ensure that some of those problems don't ever happen again. So that was our meeting. Thank you. Uh, now we're moving on to the Regional Air Quality Council. I don't see Joyce Thomas here, and she's not. No, nope, she is not here this evening. So I'm gonna. I'll give you a brief review. 
Um, we got an uh, update on the ozone season. Um, it was not good news. Uh, we discussed the EPA proposal to reclassify the Denver North Front Range area uh, to moderate for the 2008 ozone standard. Um, there, we got a stat, there was a status report. There are subcommittees that have been formed in anticipation of preparing the new state implementation plan. So we had a report from um, those subcommittees. And uh, we also had a status report on the alternative fuels program, uh, Charge Ahead Colorado and Alt Fuels Colorado. And um, if you guys may recall, uh, a significant amount of money was taken from um, C our CMAC funds and given to the Governor's Energy Office. So there was an update on um, how that money is being spent. And I actually uh, think we're going to try and bring that to this body uh, October in October, so you'll get the full details there. Um, now, uh, that's it from RAC. Uh, Mayor Ron Rakowski on E-470. I had a city conflict, so my alternate attended, but she's not here tonight, so I defer to Commissioner Partridge and Councilman ben uh, Benson. Partridge's been busy. <laughs> well, that's what he gets paid the big bucks for. That's right. <laughs> Unfortunately, I missed also it was a 10 county budget, so I apologize. Oh. <laughs> Councilman or die? Oh no, Benson. I didn't see him there. Well, I'm, I've been trying to figure out what that, this meeting might have had to do with something that might concern Dr. Cog. And uh, E-470's got more money than Dr. Cog. So, I know. So, uh, they, and they've got transportation we're, we're gonna be, money. We're going to be widening uh, the road, maybe 10 miles east <laughs> of uh, uh, I-25. Uh, our executive director is resigning at the end of the year, so if anybody's interested in applying for a job, that'll pay about $190,000 a year. And you've got some experience in finance and operating a toll road, you might send in your resume. But All right. Th 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 that's about it. I, th I think you're going to be hit up at right after the meeting. I think there's a number of well, people that, that to do with might, might qualify in the room. So uh, I do not see Mr. Van Meter here, so I think we are going to skip our report on fast tracks. Uh, in your packet informational items, I'd ask you to please take a look at attachment F, the Me MVIC uh, Metrovision Issue Committee summary, the uh, Administrative Committee summary is attachment G, and relevant clippings and other uh, communications of interest is an attachment F. Um, our next meeting is October 21st. Are there any other matters by the members? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Oh, exactly on time, 835. <laughs> <laughs>